The growth of giant pines is unbroken for 100 miles or so, save where the river or large water courses intervene. Much of it is covered exclusively with the longleaf pine, not broken, but rolling like the waves in the middle of the great ocean. The grass grows three feet high, and hill and valley are studded all over with flowers of every hue. This 1840 account by historian John F. Claiborne depicts what early European settlers were confronted with in what is now the southeastern United States, an upland forest that was dominated by a single species of tree, longleaf pine. Stretching from the coastal plain of southern Virginia into eastern Texas, Longleaf occurred on nearly 90 million acres. The forest seemed to be an endless resource. Now listed as the third rarest ecosystem in the U.S., only about 3 million of the original 90 million acres still support longleaf pine. This is a loss of over 96% of the original longleaf forest acreage. A range-wide, large-scale reduction of this ecosystem began in the 1700s with the production of naval stores such as tar and pitch and culminated with the cutting of the original forest at the turn of the 20th century. During this time, there was little to no regard for what sort of forest would result. Finally, adding to the decline of the forest was a major effort to suppress all fires, whether natural or set by the hand of man. This was due to a shift in public perception that fire was detrimental to the forest. Other causes for the forest loss include agriculture, conversion of native longleaf stands to non-longleaf pine plantations, urbanization, and rural development. In response to the decline of this unique forest type, T.R. Miller Mill Company and the USDA Forest Service established the Escambia Experimental Forest in 1947. This 3,000-acre field laboratory was developed primarily to study problems associated with the management of longleaf pine forests. Due to its central location in the longleaf pine belt in South Alabama, it is well situated to the study of longleaf pine. Miller Mill and Senior T.R. Miller Mill Company knew the station might be interested in the experimental forest on longleaf pine. He offered to provide a research site for the station uh, after surveying se several different locations, but they decided to take the area where the present forest is located with 3,000 acres which the company went ahead then and leased to the Forest Service on a 99 uh, year lease with Forest Service having full control with T.R. Miller getting any timber that was removed from the site. So the timber still belonged to the company and if it was removed, uh, it was their, their timber. At the time the Escambia Experimental Forest was created, about half the forest land in the south was in small woodlots. Many of these tracks had been heavily cut over and returns were low from any forestry activity. Landowners needed practical forest management information to help them understand costs and returns if they chose to intensively manage their land and apply best known practices. It was in response to this need that the Farm 40 was established in 1948 as a demonstration of small woodlot management. The 40 was selected as typical of the 35 to 45 year old understocked second growth longleaf pine forests common to the coastal plains of the Gulf South. The objective was to show what a private landowner could do with a less than optimal stand of longleaf pine to generate income over time with minimal monetary investment and labor. Presently we are on what is called the Escambia Farm Forestry 40, the 40 acre track which is set up for uh, management as a demonstration uh, for us to private landowners who might be wishing to manage their, their longleaf pine stands and uh, so this was set up for that purpose. They had, uh, uh, beginning of the first year, had annual harvests. 
Uh, they harvested, of course, uh, uh, poles and logs and, and uh, pulpwood, and also they had turpentine trees, so they were collecting gum as well. So they had so these on display every year for what they call the Farm Forestry Field Day. And again, we usually had a number of local landowners that came by to see the latest, and uh, hopefully we're, we're promoting the management of Longleaf Pine for those who had some and wanted to do something with it and uh, get some returns at a minimum cost. The primary cost being uh, uh, periodic prescribed burning and, and uh, other treatments that might be necessary, but generally not at any great expense. Forests are dynamic systems that change with time. A photo point was established on the Farm 40 to document changes to sand development since the early 1950s. The fundamental management approach on the Farm 40 is to use the natural capacity of longleaf to re-establish itself. Natural regeneration does not require purchase of seed and expenses are lower for manpower and equipment operation. Large cash expenditures are unnecessary and fewer non-renewable resources such as fossil fuels are needed. Early studies on the Escambia Experimental Forest proved that natural regeneration could best be achieved by thinning a stand to mimic nature on a small scale. This technique of retaining parent trees until the future forest of new seedlings is well established is called the Shelterwood Method. While a stand re-establishes itself, high value wood can be grown on the remaining large, well-spaced seed bearing trees. Retaining a partial stand of mature straight trees is aesthetically and environmentally preferable to clear cutting and incurs less risk of soil erosion. Leaving the highest quality seed bears in a stand selects for a future forest best adapted to the particular conditions on a site. Well, we start out by, by uh, setting up an area that they feel needs, it needs to be harvested. They set it up for shelterwood regeneration, small area, maybe two, three, half, a, half an acre to two or three acres in size, and uh, set that up for, for regeneration, get the regeneration, remove the overstory, uh, with a new stand started, got a new age class started, then they move on to an older stand, which is about ready for harvest. A number of age classes uh, being developed uh, within the 40. So there'll always be something then uh, mature to be harvested and uh, everything in between. So it'd be a continuous uh, revenue uh, from the track without having to expend much money on it other than maintenance such as burning and that sort of thing. Fire is an essential disturbance in a longleaf pine ecosystem and without it, hardwoods and shrubs take over, preventing successful reestablishment and growth of longleaf seedlings. Although hardwoods may be controlled in some cases using herbicides, longleaf pine forests are uniquely adapted to frequent fire, which provides additional benefits to the ecosystem. Depending almost entirely on fire, we have had herbicide research here, a certain amount of it, but we found that the other ways to handle this, especially fire. When we got the switching spring burns, uh, that was one of the things we were using to try to bring back the cane breaks. And in connection with that, on, on a slash pine flat down below the hill, we found for the first time in all the many years of the farm 40, pitcher plants coming in after the spring burns. And this was only about 10 years ago that we were doing this. So we've been here all these years. We've been monitoring the, the, the habitat. We've been monitoring the vegetation and everything. And, and, and uh, the first time we ever saw those critters show up. So apparently the spring bird controlled the, the vegetation enough that the pitcher plant finally said we can make it. So they did. And I think that's true for almost all pitcher plant areas is you have to burn it to keep that competition out. And it also brought back the cane breaks. Winter burns didn't do it. They didn't go far enough. And of course most of the hardwoods survive it. They just sprout up again and kill the top. They sprout again. I think that sheet I had showed where we had a winter, spring, summer burns in different densities show that, uh, that uh, spring burns are much more effective than the other as far as eliminating hardwoods. The Farm 40 was set up as a demonstration forest for private landowners to see how they might effectively manage their tracks with limited monetary input. This forest was harvested as a series of group shelterwood cuts where small groups were cut back 
to a low stand density and regenerated. Eventually, older stands were removed as the new stand matured. Over time, a number of age classes were developed within the 40, so there were always mature stands to be harvested, providing periodic revenue from the forest with minimal cost to the landowner. Over 60 years of research on the Escambia's Farm 40 has provided information vital to the southern landowner and timber manager. As the timber grows in response to forces such as hurricanes and as interest in new forest products develop, the Farm 40 will continue to be managed with the private landowner in mind. It is a real-world living demonstration of proven techniques that can be used to produce both tangible products and aesthetic values. Forest researchers continue to use the Escambia Experimental Forest to delve into many longleaf management concerns and problems. Research topics over the past 60 years have included natural regeneration, stand management and growth, site quality in soils, fire ecology, and woods grazing. Well, anytime you get out here, there's always something, something new you can pick up. I'm finding something new all the time when I have it get myself exposed to it. The experimental forest is also frequently used for the education and enjoyment for a variety of visitors, including school children and forestry students. Visitors are welcome, and tours and field days continue to inspire us as we strive to better understand the biological needs of longleaf pine, techniques of natural regeneration, and the role of fire in establishing and maintaining this distinctly southern forest. Ha, 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 ha.